All right, welcome to another uh, session here at Unitize 2020. I am David Waxman and I'm your host today. Uh, I'm joined at a fireside chat by one of the preeminent leaders in distributed ledger technology. Mance Harmon is the CEO of Hedera, the makers of Hashgraph, which is a remarkable technology. Actually, it's a stack of technologies that has been around for a little while. Uh, we're gonna be talking about something very important today. Can decentralized tech, especially the type that we've embraced in this industry, can it actually take on the major players in Silicon Valley, in China and beyond, the centralized entities that today control a huge percentage of our online lives and increasingly the more tangible terrestrial forms too? Mance, I guess we should get started perhaps by talking a little bit about the background of Hedera, because I think people need to understand exactly how Hedera is constructed first, understand why you are positioned perhaps to take on some of these entities that are far larger than anything in, in blockchain today. Okay. Well, great. So first off, thank you for uh, having me here in this fireside chat. I appreciate it. So Hedera, from the very beginning, we've always understood that in order to be successful, in order to win, so to speak, in this competition, you have to have more than tech. You have to have both fantastic technology, which we have in the hash graph, and we can talk about that as an algorithm, an alternative to blockchain, a consensus algorithm that has fantastic security and performance properties that uh, you know, go orders of magnitude beyond first and second generation tech in the DLT industry. But equally important as the technology itself, is the governance framework if we're talking about a public network. And that's what Hedera is. It's a public uh, network that is built on top of the Hashgraph algorithm. And uh, the, the governing body for this global public network is specifically designed to be the most decentralized, distributed, highly professional group of governors, if you want to think of them or use that word to describe them, council members uh, in the industry. And, and so what that looks like is ultimately a council of 39 global blue chip organizations. Today we've announced 15 or 16, I, I've lost count, but, but about 15 or 16 and they contain some of the uh, some of the biggest companies in the world. So we have we have Google as a council member, and Boeing, and IBM, and uh, FIS WorldPay, and Tata Communications, uh, Nomura from Asia, and DLA Piper, and the list goes on. And and we've chosen those organizations because they represent the best of their industry in each of their vertical markets. And they've been chosen to represent a global uh, economy, a global universe of use cases. And so when, when building this governing council to govern the platform in this technology that will be used by enterprises around the world to build mission critical, high value applications on top of, we've chosen those organizations to be the very best in their industries with high degree of, of trust and also to be geo-distributed uh, around the globe, no, no concentration in any major ge geography. And then finally, ultimately, to be distributed through time as well, meaning that the council members that join us today can't stay members that are governing this public network forever. They can be with us for a maximum of six years, two, three-year terms. And um, that's a big part of the, quote, product. It's a big part of the value proposition, right? When there are organizations that are considering building a distributed application on top of our platform, they want to know that the body of, of organizations that is governing this network knows what they're doing, that they're competent, and that they're going to be around forever, and that they are making decisions that's in the interest of the community at large, not any single member or single organization. So that's what Hedera is. It's a next generation public network. Uh, it is in the DLT space. It's, it's not blockchain, it's Hashgraph. And uh, has fantastic tech and this world-class governing council that manages the whole thing. So let's pretend I'm a company that, or 
let's say a set of developers that want to potentially build off this stack. Mm. I, I need to know whether or not I'm going to actually build a lasting company built on lasting infrastructure. One of the challenges, of course, that Hedera has faced, and, and you've gotten a lot of flack for this, is that you're not fully open source the way that other protocols uh, say they are. Sure. Why is that the case? I mean, how can you, how, yeah. how is it that a, a developer out there or a series of developers can build on you and feel enough trust in what they're building on uh, in terms of the, the rails themselves? Uh, and, and what does this have to do with it? Yeah. Um, so there are two questions and loosely related. Uh, so let's start with the open source question first, and then we'll build to the, to the next. Sure. Um, on the open source question, one of the original design goals when pulling together Hedera back in 2017. So by the way, the tech has been in development since 2014. Software has been being written since 2014. The algorithm, Lehman Baird, my co-founder, the inventor of Hashgraph, started working on the algorithm in 2012. And... Uh, came up with Hashgraph in the 2015 timeframe. And, and so it's been in development for a long time. When, when we decided it was time to consider building a public network on top of Hashgraph, there were a, a handful of obstacles to mainstream adoption that we identified. Two of them we've already talked about, just technology itself and the ability to scale. We need to be able to process tens of thousands of transactions per second, not 15 right? Number one. Uh, number two, we needed it to be the best it could be in terms of security at the protocol level. There's a theoretical limit to what you can do in distributed consensus in terms of security. It's called asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerance, and we achieved that. That was the, that was the innovation of Hashgraph, is being able to scale and be as fast as it is, while at the same time checking the box of security. Um, Number three, well, number four in, in my mental list, number four was governance. And we've already talked about governance and what that looks like for us. And the goal to build a 100-year company, a company that's going to last for a century. But the, number three on that list was we wanted to make it clear to the community at large that they could have confidence when building on top of this platform that it wasn't going to fork or split into, into two competing platforms. The issue here is that if you're building an application on top of a public network, and uh, it's a public ledger, and the state of your application, let's just make it more concrete. Let's say we're creating a LAN registry. The LAN registry is running on top of this public network. The registry itself is a list of entries of, of LAN parcels and who owns them. Well, if that public network hard forks into two separate networks, the state of that LAN registry also splits and it gets copied into the new network. And now you've got client software out there on phones and computers that make updates to that LAN registry. They're making those updates, calling the same nodes that they were calling before, but now the nodes are split into two separate networks. And so you have two different LAN registries that are being updated simultaneously, and that's, that's untenable. You know, for any real mainstream, hardcore uh, application, you don't want to have the risk that that's a possibility in the future. And so um, we, of course, recognize the value of open source and open, making it possible for the community to review every single line of code. And most of the code base will be, will be open sourced and we'll be doing that this summer. It's imminent. Mm. Uh, but the portion of the code base at the very bottom of the stack, the part that is the hash graph layer and, and the comms associated with that across the nodes, it is open review. It will be released as well so that every line of code can be reviewed and, and you know, be tracked by those that care about the security of the network and want transparency, but it's not open source. It is, uh, it's a different license. You can download it, review it, test it, play with it, but you can't fork the network, not legally anyway. And, uh, and for those that do it illegally, well, you know, mainstream companies aren't gonna go build 
multi-million dollar applications on illegitimate public networks. So we're not really concerned about that. But we are concerned about providing stability for the, for the mainstream customers and at the same time, transparency. And so that's the strategy. That's the reason behind uh, the, the choice to make it open review, part of it open review as opposed to open source. And, and that will be unfolding this summer. So let me get this straight. We've got a developer here. They decide they're going to go and build on top of Hedera, the Hedera platform because what you do is you have next generation technology. You've got a governing council you can trust, but that can actually be effectively voted out perhaps uh, or is going to leave their term with three or six years from now. Uh, and maybe another blue chip company comes in. And these are these companies, let's talk about the governance for a little bit uh, yeah. in, in just a moment. But so someone's building on top of you and they, are, they can be certain that although the code is genuine, that the code can be trusted because they can read it themselves, that there's not going to be a possibility of a fork. And the reason why, uh, Mance, I want to talk about this today is there's a lot of conversation right now about Ethereum kind of changing its very nature over mm. the summer. And there, is, there are concerns by some that smart contracts may break. Yeah. That per, and so I'm going to use smart contract as a a, for, a basic form of a company. And if then uh, a company has a lot of if thens in it every day, right. uh, and a complex software company is going to even have more. So can you can you perhaps comment on on how Hedera's policy uh, and 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 the way Hedera has been architected is different, let's say, than Ethereum? Sure. Yeah. So thank you for that question. That's it's a really important question. So if you look at the public networks today, Ethereum is a great example, but it's not limited to, to Ethereum. It's just about all of the, the main protocol platforms. There are two activities that are taking place on the platforms. First, transactions are flowing in and the network does the work of putting those transactions into a consensus order, right? So you get a stream of transactions that are ordered by the network. Um, and that's where the distributed trust comes in. You, you, you don't want a single party putting transactions in order. You want the community to come to an agreement on the order of those transactions. And then secondly, you take that transaction stream and you feed it into the smart contract layer. And that's the way just about the whole world works today. And, and I don't like this model at all for a number of reasons. Number one, the information that is flowing into the smart contracts, if you want the smart contracts to operate on that information, it has to be plain text. It can't be encrypted. So you get a real confidentiality and privacy concern associated with that. Uh, it's just like your smart contract is going to take X and add it to Y. Well, it can't add X and Y unless it knows the value of X and Y. And, and so you got a problem there. And there are a lot of use cases where companies just will not use a public network if their data is going to be publicly viewable in that way. Number two, when these smart contracts are running, they're running on a, a finite set of nodes in this network, and all the smart contracts in the, in the network are competing for that same select, you know, scarce resource that those CPU cycles on those nodes. Because of that, the cost of running the smart contract goes way up. And additionally, if you've got really heavy duty uh, applications or use cases, they can't scale. They can't scale in that environment. There's no way they're gonna be able to. So what we've done is just recognize this is a problem. And we've taken that second layer, the smart contract layer, and we've moved it into a private network environment. It's not a private consensus network, but it is a network of nodes that is running that business logic. And so let's go back to the land registry example that I was just sure. talking about. Over here in this private network, you could have any number of nodes, each containing a local copy of that land registry. But when the client software in the field wants to make updates to the land registry, they call the Hedera network, it's a particular service, we call it the Hedera consensus service, and HCS for short. So HCS accepts all the transactions, puts them into a consensus order, and then streams those transactions in order to all the nodes in this private network that's just focused, dedicated entirely to this land registry application. And over here in that network, we call it an application net in this case, they do the, the business logic of updating the land registry and, and making sure that they're valid 
transactions, et cetera, et cetera, but they're private. They don't have the privacy concerns of a public network. The transactions can be encrypted as they flow through Adara, and all they do is get put into order. And then over here, you can scale as necessary, you can manage your costs, you can maintain privacy, you can do anything you want. What we're offering is the public trust of a public network as a service. It's okay, so let's talk a little bit about that, man, because the premise of this, of this conversation that we're having is, is there a competitive advantage to distributed ledger technology relative to what's already out there from some of these massive tech companies? Um, and so what I, what I want to understand is, is this is going to be actually something that I can build a real business off of? Um, and do I have an advantage using distributed tech versus using something that's called, that's called centralized? Yeah. No, it's a great question. So, you know, I view the world in really two categories. Um, one is brand new business models, brand new technologies where they're, you know, they're starting off and they're going to build a distributed application from the ground up. And the models that you use are, are perhaps different than you might use if you already have a centralized application. Or, uh, you, you know, what you care about is, is running your business in a centralized environment, but you want the added trust of the public network for a part of it. What we, what we call trust plus, if you will, and mm -hmm. internally here within Hedera. And so, yes, there are a whole host of use cases out there, especially around audit and proof of action, being able to prove that, that you've actually done something in a workflow, taken an action in a workflow for, for whatever reason uh, it might be, might be appropriate for your business case. But you're running a central organization, a central database, if you will, for your business, but leveraging the public trust to prove to the market as a whole that there are actions that you've actually taken and that maybe the regulators care about. And so the world breaks down into centralized with trust plus or decentralized where you have a consortium of organizations that maybe are in part of a supply chain, right? The, the members of a supply chain, each wanting to have a common view into the same database, quote, quote, in this case, public ledger, um, all of that being updated and, and managed and enabled by the Hedera consensus service with this new, uh, you know, this new DLT model that, that the market is beginning to get used to. So if I'm a, let's call it a traditional company right now, I can have a competitive advantage by perhaps leveraging this, the trust plus uh, that comes with the consensus service, right? With Absolutely. ACS. So if you're competing uh, and the, your customer base or the regulators that you have to do business with or whomever um, is, is worried about uh, transparency, take ad tech, for example, right? If you're an advertising agency or you're, you're matching um, publishers with, uh, you, know, you know, those that have market space for, for ads and there's concern about the, the veracity of the transactions that are taking the place on that platform, then with every transaction, you can use the Hedera network to put a timestamp and provide an additional layer of, of trust on the product that you are selling to the market. And so that is a differentiating factor over, um, over those that don't have it. So yes, those that have centralized businesses that want to add an additional layer of transparency and trust can do so where their competition simply can't unless they're doing the same thing. Yeah. Does Hedera have what you call replacement tech for some of the, let's call it earlier generation technologies? As an example, um, you have a really interesting, and I don't think this is explored sufficiently, approach to decentralized storage. Um, and, uh, and for instance, the right to forget is, which is something people aren't really talking a whole lot about, but becomes yeah. a major problem in, in increasingly surveillance uh, universe that we're living in. Uh, can you talk a little bit about kind of how Hedera is approaching storage and, and if that is essentially a replacement tech for off the shelf products? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we do have a distributed file system that's part of the platform. The, the, the services on the platform, by the way, are cryptocurrency as a service distributed file storage, and smart contracts, Solidity, you know, same tech that Ethereum is using, uh, even though I don't like that model. 
and HCS, the Hedera Consensus Service, what we've just talked about. The, the file system isn't really meant to be a replacement for, say, S3 on Amazon, right? It, it, that serves a different purpose. The file system here is meant to provide the storage that might be needed for uh, enabling certain functions within your distributed application. You might take a video file and uh, hash it and store that in the file system so that later, if you want to, you can take that same video file, give it to somebody, let them hash it, and compare the hashes and see that the video itself has not been altered in any way, or pictures or documents or, or whatever it is. But you wouldn't take the whole video and, and put it into our file system because it's too expensive. I mean, if you think about it, S3 is going to take a, a few computers or a few hard drives and store information there. The hard costs are the costs associated with those few hard drives. In a distributed file system environment, we're going to have 39 nodes each running a hard drive. And just the, the, you know, the base costs associated with that are higher by an order of magnitude. And so the, the economics don't work, and it's not intended to be a replacement for that kind of storage. But it is, it is there to enable distributed applications. Um, I'm sorry, you, there was a second part of that question. I, mean, I was asking about replacement tech. Does Hedera oh. offer replacement tech uh, with any of the services that you currently offer or perhaps plan to offer? Um, so if it's replacement for the first generations of uh, DLT, oh, you asked about um, right to be forgotten. That, that right. was it in, in the file system. Yes, thank you. So in blockchain today, when people store something in blockchain, what that means is they make an entry and that entry is in this immutable ledger forever. In our system, it doesn't work that way. When you make an entry, uh, the entry changes the state of the application of the, of the ledger and then others those that are running uh, copies of our nodes, we call them mirror nodes, they will record that ledger forever. And so they can record that. But um, by doing it the way that we're doing it, we have what we call controlled mutability. So if I'm storing a, a piece of information in the file system and the file system, you know, subsequently what we learn is that it's illegal for some reason, uh, or you want to delete that information, then you can go back and you can remove it. There are commands that allow you to delete the files from the file system. What's important is that when the files get deleted from the file system, we can provide you a proof from the community, not from a central organization, but a community attested proof that those files have in fact been deleted. In other words, the right to be forgotten can be implemented in, in our file system and our network more generally. And so, yes, when there are identity related applications that are taking advantage of the file system, that right to be forgotten is enabled and, um, and, and you can use it in that way. So you get proof that the information has been stored, but equally important, maybe more important, you get proof that it's been deleted. It's controlled mutability is what we call it. Man, so there's a couple of questions that I, I've gotten uh, that I've got to ask on behalf of a lot sure. of people out there who've been following Hedera. The first question is, what projects or companies within this industry outside of Hedera do you admire uh, that perhaps you've learned a couple lessons from? Um, so, yeah, you know what? There, there is an individual that I do follow that I respect highly, and uh, that's Naval Naval Ramkant. You know, uh, he he uh, he's been around the industry for a long time. Uh, fantastic entrepreneur has done a lot of cool things, and I like to. I think we sort of share the same philosophy about how this industry will unfold over time. So I uh, I follow him. You know, there's some fantastic success stories in the industry uh, that are just just killing it. And, and they aren't necessarily platforms like ours, but, um, you, you know, what's happening over at Coinbase and, and what they've done, what they've built. 
and uh, their attention to being regulatory compliant and caring about those things and trying to build a respectable exchange uh, that is compliant and doing it the right way. Uh, so I've, you know, I've, I've followed them closely. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing is that the industry is changing from what it was. And it, it came from a certain place with certain roots. And those roots are important for getting adoption and helping to bootstrap. And what's happening now, I think, is that a new crop of players are entering into the market that are taking what has been built and now trying to um, put it into a form that can achieve mass adoption. And I think that's important. And what will happen as a result of it is that the old players, their tech will either morph or it will die off. And, um, and when it morphs, it will become more in increasingly differentiated. The stack of technologies that we've been talking about each layer of the stack is going to end up with an entire ecosystem of competitors competing just for the, just for the components within that stack. And I see that we're leading that, right? I mean, that's what we're doing with the Hedera consensus service. We're just doing transaction ordering with the service. And anybody who wants to build smart contracts on top of us can do it. Uh, you know, it, it works for private networks, Hyperledger, Quorum, et cetera, or it could work hypothetically. You could take, uh, just a, a DAP network that is Ethereum and use HCS for transaction ordering. I don't know anybody would do that, but it's possible, right? Hypothetically, it's possible. So there are a lot of cool things going on in the market. I do like the, um, the interoperability work that's being done by, by some of the platforms. I think that's important. I like the standards work that's being done by IWA, uh, especially, you know, the, the new announcements recently with IWA and the token taxonomy framework that's being pursued. We're, we're part of that. Um, so all of the standards work is important. Uh, and I think that we, we want to support that. Um, but the industry is changing and, uh, you, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how it evolves over the next two years. All right. Well, one last question for you, Mance, before we run out of time, you have, an extraordinary governance council. You actually had an ad in the wall street journal last year that, uh, basically told Libra who's boss. You guys were the originators of this type of distributed uh, council of remarkable companies. And I've got to ask, because there's so many sm small companies, medium-sized companies already building on the DARE, and we see this news all the time. Are some of those council members building something exciting too? Can you give us any hints at all? The answer is absolutely yes. Uh, some of them are. Some of them have made announcements. Others haven't. Uh, DLA Piper is one of those that has, it's, you know, they've been very public about, uh, the tokenization work that they're doing for commercial real estate. Uh, and others, others haven't, <laughs> others haven't talked publicly about what they're doing. But what I can say is that, yeah, there, there's definite, there are applications that are being, uh, developed, uh, at various stages of completion and maturity. And um, while we've been, you know, we've started off here making a bunch of, of announcements about council members and we'll continue to do that until we get to 39. It's what will be sort of layered into those announcements will in the nearer term start being announcements about use cases that are going public. And so the, you know, the market can certainly expect that. Very exciting. Well, Mance Harmon, CEO of Hedera. Thank you so much for, for being here today at Unitize. Really appreciate having you on. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.